All right, folks, we're going to draw some more Lewis structures today, and we're going to include um, shape, bond angle, and polarity. So by now, you should be pretty darn good at drawing Lewis structures, uh, counting up valence electrons. And now we're going to add to that a couple more things. So let me just quickly go over these rules for drawing a Lewis structure with you one more time. Uh, when you draw a Lewis structure, count the number of total valence electrons available to place around the atoms. Um, get a total. And then you're going to connect each atom to another with a single bonding pair. We'll try single bonds first. And then the remaining electrons, what you're going to do is you're going to place them around the atoms as non-bonding pairs, trying to complete your octets. Um, sometimes you might need a double bond and you might need a triple bond. But make sure you need to uh, make sure that you keep in mind the octet rule uh, with regards to stability and why atoms are reacting and bonding in the first place. It's to get those four pairs of valence electrons. Alrighty, so let's take a look here. Let's draw the Lewis structure again for water. I know you've done this a couple times. Let's do it. Oh, what the heck, just one more time. And so water, of course, is H2O. We have two hydrogens. Each has one valence electrons, electron, and, uh, and oxygen has six valence electrons, so we have a total of eight. So we're going to put oxygen in the center, and we'll put a bonding pair between oxygen and the hydrogen to the right, and a bonding pair to the hydrogen to the left. That's four of my eight, and we will complete oxygen's octet. So voila, there's our Lewis structure for water. Now, it's time to discuss shape. What shape would this molecule have? Well, the way it's drawn, a lot of folks say that it would have a linear arrangement. Now, let me show you what that would mean. If it were linear, it would just be oxygen in the center, or oxygen in the center with a hydrogen on either side. We'd have this linear shape. Okay? Another option could be bent, and bent would have maybe this type of arrangement. So those are our two choices. This first one, the one on the left, is called linear, and the one on the right is called bent. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly what the shape is yet. We're going to come back to that later. But I do want to discuss a little bit about polarity and how shape can sometimes affect the polarity of a molecule. Now, remember, polarity results when there's an uneven uh, distribution of electrons. The electrons aren't being shared equally. And that's because atoms have different electronegativities. So in this situation, we have a hydrogen here and an oxygen here and a hydrogen on the other side. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. That shared pair is spending more time around the oxygen atom than it is the hydrogen. Or if we have the bent arrangement, we'd see the same thing. Now, if it were linear, um, it would turn out that the dipoles created due to the uneven distribution of electrons, those dipoles would cancel. Dipoles are vector quantities, which means they have both magnitude and direction. And so in the case of a linear arrangement, we might have a dipole going in this direction, and we would have a dipole going in this direction. If it's linear, they'd end up canceling each other out, and there would be no net dipole, so it would be nonpolar. But if it were a bent arrangement, we would have a dipole moving in this direction, and another dipole moving in this direction. They would have an additive effect, and we would have a polar molecule. So, knowing the shape really helps us in determining whether the molecule is going to be polar or nonpolar. So, it's pretty important to figure out what that shape is, whether it's going to be linear or bent. Okay, let's redraw the Lewis structure for ammonia. I think we did that earlier also. And so, nitrogen has five valence, and each hydrogen has one valence for a total of eight valence electrons. We'll put nitrogen in the center. And we'll go ahead and bond a hydrogen to the left and to the right, and we'll stick one down below. And we'll put a non-bonding pair on the nitrogen here. Now, what shape do you think that would have? Well, we have a couple of choices again. We could end up with what we call a trigonal pyramid. It would look something like this. Or we might have what we call a planar arrangement, a trigonal planar, which would look like this. See, we have three bonding hydrogens to that nitrogen, so we could have that structure right there, which we would call trigonal planar. Or we have this structure right here. You can see that's the, 
the nitrogen in the center is lifted up off the paper, and we call that a trigonal pyramid. So those are our two options. I've put pictures on the next page for you. So once again, this guy up here would be called trigonal planar. And this one over here would be trigonal pyramid. And once again, polarity is going to be determined by the shape of this molecule. Now you can see here that my dipoles would cancel. And I like to pretend that dipoles are sort of like little spaceships. So we have a hydrogen here, here, and here. And we're going to pretend that those are spaceships. And they have their tractor beams out, and they're, they're, they're attached to this, I don't know, asteroid in the center. If I have a spaceship pulling in this direction with a certain magnitude, and an identical spaceship pulling in this direction, and a third pulling in that direction, what would the effect of those three dipoles uh, added together, what would, what would the overall effect be? Well, the asteroid wouldn't move, would it? These guys are all fighting against each other. It would stay in one spot. So if it were trigonal planar, and I'm not saying that it is, if it were trigonal planar, hopefully you can see how it would be nonpolar. But if it were this pyramidal shape, we would have these three spaceships pulling, one going up and one going down here towards the back and one coming towards the front. They would have an additive effect, and you can imagine that asteroid in the middle might be pulled in a direction like that by those spaceships. And if that asteroid in the middle moves as a result of a net dipole, we would say it's polar. If it's stationary, it doesn't move, we would say that it's nonpolar. Okay, so shape is pretty doggone important oftentimes when we're trying to figure out polarity. Okay, methane's next. Carbon has four valence, and each hydrogen has one valence for a total of eight valence electrons again. So I'll put carbon in the center, and we will bond the four hydrogens to it. And right away you think you know the shape. You say, aha, uh -huh, Hummer, that's going to be just a nice planar arrangement. So we might have what we call a square planar. I have that built over here for you, off screen, and I'll put it right down there for you. So you might think that's the arrangement, and we would call that square planar if it were. But couldn't it also have this type of arrangement, where those four pairs arrange themselves more three-dimensionally, and we end up with something like that. Now the one on the left is called tetrahedral. And the one on the right is called square planar. So it's our job to figure out what that shape is. Does methane arrange themselves, uh, the atoms of methane arrange themselves like this around the carbon, or like this? And the knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, geez, Hummer, the, the Lewis structure shows it flat on one plane. Yeah, it does, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the shape. Don't you think that's sort of hard, uh, this shape, this tetrahedral, to draw on a flat piece of paper? So even if it were that shape, we probably wouldn't draw it because it's just so hard to draw. We'd probably still illustrate it like that. So we need to figure out what that is. Now to do that, we are going to use something called the VSEPR model. And VSEPR, V-S-E-P-R, stands for valence... shell, so we're talking about the outer electrons, the valence electrons, electron pair repulsion model. All this is saying that electron pairs, when they're bonded to a central atom, love to be as far away from each other as possible. They repel each other. They have negative charges, and two negative charges don't want to come together. They want to repel each other, but at the same time, they're stuck to this guy in the middle. So they want to get as far away from each other as they possibly can while being stuck to that central atom. And this valence shell electron pair repulsion model helps us determine how they will arrange themselves. So this simply means that electron pairs around a central atom tend to be as far away from each other as possible. Let's go back to methane. That's the one we just had up there. I'll draw a small version of the Lewis structure right here. We'll squeeze it in. Okay, there's my methane. How many pairs do we see around the central atom? 
Well, there's one, two, three, four pairs. Remember, four pairs is nice and stable. Are those pairs of electrons bonding or are they non-bonding? Well, looks like all of them are bonding. So I'm going to circle bonding there. They're all four pairs bonding. So how can these pairs arrange themselves around an atom so that they're as far away from each other as possible? There's our choices again. Tetrahedral or square planar. How are they going to do it? Well, what I did is I blew up four balloons and I tied them together in the center. And those four balloons, pretty close to the same size, when they're tied together, tend to push each other away. If I tried to flatten them out into this planar arrangement, as soon as I let it go, they would pop back up into this tetrahedral arrangement. And that's the same thing that electrons do when I have four pairs bonded to a central atom. They like this tetrahedral shape. It's low energy. They're as far away from each other as they possibly can be. So the name of that arrangement is tetrahedral. And the electronic geometry of, ge of methane is tetrahedral. So electronic geometry means we're not looking at the hydrogens that are bonded to it. We're just looking at the pairs of electrons around the central atom. And those four pairs, sort of kind of like balloons, take that shape to be as far away from each other as possible. Now the shape of the molecule is known as molecular geometry. And so if we bond these four hydrogens to my carbon, the molecule shape or molecular shape would also be tetrahedral in this case. Okay, and that bond angle, this angle right here between hydrogen, carbon, and hydrogen, doesn't make a difference which, which ones I look at, is going to be 109.5 degrees. That's farther apart than if I were to use the square planar arrangement, which is obviously a right angle or 90 degrees. So 109.5 is better, requires less energy for those pairs to be stuck to that carbon because they're as far away from each other as possible. Now think about our little spaceship analogy. Would that be polar or nonpolar? Mm -hmm. Let's see, we have vector quantities, four of them. They're all like spaceships pulling on that central asteroid there. It's not going to move, is it? So that's going to be nonpolar. So once again, to determine this, we look at the bonds and the shape of the molecule. All right, if we did that, once again, we're drawing this Lewis structure several times. Right, here's methane again, folks. And there is an electronegativity difference here. That bond is polar. The bond is polar. But the molecule is nonpolar. Because the dipoles cancel each other out. Those four pair pulling in that orientation will cancel each other out. Now, just an interesting side note, let's say that one of these hydrogens was replaced with, let's say, a chlorine. Would that still be nonpolar? Well, no, it wouldn't be. That's sort of like adding a, a new spaceship to the mix, isn't it? And so now they're not pulling with the same force, and we would have a net dipole, either moving away or, or in one direction or the other. They wouldn't completely cancel each other out. So if those atoms are different, we would have a dipole. If they're the same, all the dipoles cancel each other out. All right. So dipoles act as vector quantities. They have both magnitude and direction. If we were to add these dipoles together, they would cancel. And we would have a nonpolar molecule. All right. Now, let's decide the shape, bond angles, and polarity of ammonia. Here's the ammonia molecule again, NH3, a non-bonding pair up there. Okay, well, let's build that. Okay, if I were to build that, we'd have one, two, three, four pairs around the central atom. Three of them are bonding, and one is non-bonding. Now, isn't that the shape we would expect to see? Because these four pairs want to be away from each other, even though this is non-bonding, it's still going to push these other others away. So the shape of this would be our trigonal pyramid shape. Okay, now we're going to talk more about this and we're going to do a bunch more in the next video. So stay tuned. This is just the introduction. Stay tuned and we will do more in predicting not only the shape, but the bond angle, this angle right here between atoms, and the polarity.
All right. See you next time. Bye-bye.